So um, I always love it when we can get a little bit engaged with these panels too. So I'm going to first remind everybody, please do feel free. I'm going to ask questions of individuals, but I'd love to hear other panelists' contributions because there are a lot of themes here that are sort of mingling with each other and it would be great to tease those out. But Dr. Bhatti, I'd like to start with you. I love the storytelling uh, you know, that you did with a specific case example and you know, people on the floor together and how many and how that works. What are some ways we can, can start with that if we don't, if we, you know, it's great to co-create co when you're together. How are some ways that uh, people could get started in any, in any environment? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and thank you for it. I, um, one thing I ran out of time for was that last slide of, of things that one can do. Um, and one thing that I think it's really important to do is what we call intentional teaming. Um, and, and you can do this at any level. You can do this in medicine. You could do this if you run a lab. And that is to bring people just around the table uh, into your lab meeting um, as part of the invention process. So I always have MD-PhD students or medical fellows in the room. Um, I have a diverse lab in terms of women around the table, underrepresented minorities, but I think you, you need to make a safe space for people to actually not know the answer, not know the jargon, um, and be able to bat ideas around. And then I think it's also important in the intentional teaming to have some bilingual individuals um, who can help translate. Um, because a lot of us are speaking different languages. So I think that's something that anybody in this room could do tomorrow in any of their sort of creation activities is do more intentional teaming. Your thoughts? Anybody would like to share about that? Why go on? I think it's absolutely true that if you're, the word silo came up before, maybe not, mm -hmm. so um, that if you're, if you stay in your lab and stay in your lane, uh, you'll miss out on the opportunities to Bump into bump into other ideas. So I'm I'm going to use this intentional team. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Voss, I'd like to pick up with you as well. Just to next step. So I, I love the idea, and as somebody with millennials and Gen Zs and my you know my children, I know they are they are different. How do how do we help make them happy? What are some of the steps we can take? I think that when. Okay, I'm 57 years old. When I was a graduate student, there was no discussion of mentoring or climate. You came into the lab and you did, did your work, and there just wasn't any discussion of that. I think that this generation doesn't find that to be acceptable. So they, they want to be heard, they want to be taken care of, um, they want culturally aware mentoring, uh, and um, if we don't give it to them, they will leave academic science. I think it's pretty clear. I think it's like a pretty clear direct path that they have high expectations for the environment in which they live. Um, and so I do have a couple ideas to throw out there that, I mean, there's many, many mentoring the mentor programs. The University of Wisconsin has CMER, has an incredible mentoring program that teaches people, don't send an email at 2 a.m. with angry feedback on the thesis. Just don't do that. It's not helpful. <laughs> don't text them. Call me. Don't do that because they freak out. Just simple ways to be human. Another thing is <laughs> the anonymous lab survey, which I stole from my colleague Vanessa Ruta, which is an online Google form where people can um, tell you what's working, tell you what's not working, tell you things that are very sensitive that they would never say out loud. And I, I do that every year. We collect all the feedback, and then I just work through it of, OK, I will not email you at 2 in the morning anymore with bad feedback on your thesis, I won't do this. Like most of it is directed against me, um, which is fully appropriate. Uh, or it will surface some problems in the lab that I haven't been aware of. And so every year I can, I can rebalance the climate and fix problems that exist. And so then I have the hope of retaining these brilliant scientists in the lab. Also, they want snacks. They want they snacks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who isn't thinking about snacks? I have like a $500 a month snack <laughs> budget, very high snack. LaCroix snacks yes, is the only snacks key. Yes, very important. <laughs> Please. So I like all of that, Leslie, but I would add one more thing that I think is fundamental about the way that academia is working. Uh, and that is that we uh, squelch the, the kind of fundamental reason that young people decide to go into to science. And that is that, that they imagine that they can make some amazing discovery that will have a big impact. And 
So they say, this is great, you know, science should be really what I want to do. And they, and they get in to um, maybe at the undergraduate level, but certainly in graduate school. And they're told by their mentors, all of us wise people, to uh, not, do, not to try to do anything too bold, to, to, to pick a thesis project that will be sure, be sure to work, sure to generate papers, right? And okay, that's great, so you kind of hold back. Um, and then you apply for a postdoc fellowship and we tell them, now don't go crazy, you know, just kind of do something that's gonna be highly feasible that, that uh, the, fu the funding panels will like, uh, so do that. Same thing when you apply for a job, write your job proposal, uh, write, uh, uh, try, to, try to get uh, a tenure uh, in your position. And it turns out that we never in academia tell the, 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 the scientists who are so hungry to do something amazing, now's the time to really do it, right? See what, see what this little machine will do if you put the gas pedal on the floor. Um, we don't do it. Uh, instead, we hold them back. And, and I think that they get this message of careerism you know, publishing in the right places, publishing the right number of papers, right? Uh, you know, don't step outside of the par standing paradigm of the day because you won't get invited to meetings and you won't be invited to p write a review article. Um, and and, and uh, so the, they look at that and say, well, this is what I wanted to do, something wild and crazy, but I'm not allowed to do it. So they, they don't stay in, the, stay in the business. So I think all the things you said are exactly right. I agree. Right. Never tell your students to not be crazy. You have to tell them to be bold. So if you're doing that, don't do that. Right. You're not doing that. <laughs> we have something, I think, along those what? lines, Keith, which is um, we tell the students to spend 20% of their time tinkering. Yeah. Um, Great. And we say, you know, as long yeah. as you're not hurting yourself, like, those, <laughs> they call them submarine projects. And yeah, it's so to remember, like, why you love science, to be curious, to just to wonder what happens if play, take risks. Right. I think all of those things are, are, are great. I think, but I think that the endeavor overall Every, tends not to yeah. do that, tends to hold people back. I, I was just reflecting on how to, you know, change is kind of hard and working across is kind of hard. And it takes the time and space to do that. And I love it that you tell them 20% or that you, you know, encourage them to go big and go bold. Um, no, so speaking of big and bold, uh, Dr. Yamamoto, I want to come back to your points about trying to propose, a, a, or not trying to, proposing federal cooperation across a couple of dozen um, you know, science and tech agencies and extending into the private sector. That's pretty bold. Um, you know, those agencies are not necessarily known for their you know, collaboration across. <laughs> so, so how do you start to build productive bridges there? Yeah, that's a, it's a key question. And, and this Science and Technology Action Committee that I referred to um, proposed uh, planting a coordination function, a resourced coordination function in the OSTP. And then Alondra Nelson's coming up here next, so she'll be happy to hear this. Um, uh, that would be charged with having a, a, a coordinator or a coordination group for each of those um, uh, existential threats that I talked about uh, within the OSTP, whose jobs it would be to wake up every morning thinking about how to bring together the efforts across these agency boundaries that would move forward on, in each of those four areas. And so they then issue a challenge to that a collective of these agencies and says, come back to us with an idea about how in a cooperative way you could really move on this problem. And if we like what you say, we've got money for you. Because the way that the federal budgeting system works sets these agencies against each other in competition. And the way that they respond to that, and so each of these direct agency heads has to go to the Hill every year and defend themselves and say, don't forget to give me my agency money. I need more, and if, we, if you stop it, then all of this magnificent work we're doing will stop because no one else across the government is doing it. Why? Because they're not talking to each other, they're competing, they're setting up computer systems that don't interface and so forth. It's a, it's a major problem. So how to overcome that is to then provide resources to them to say, 
if you come back with a good plan, we'll, we'll give you a bunch of money that is over and above your current budget. So you don't have to spend only your money to be able to move it forward. So I think we, we need incentivization to really be able to drive that kind of cooperation. I think the will is there and the realization what, for what can be gained by the, the cooperation is there. But because of the way the federal budgeting is done, they're really constrained to work together. And I'd also like to follow up on the, the idea of giving private sector companies this funding. How, what are some ways we could go about thinking about that or rewarding it? Yeah, you can see all sorts of risks involved in, in dropping a bunch of public money on, on specific companies. And, but, but I think there are uh, pathways for doing it. And again, competitive bidding on contracts. You know, this is something the government has, been, has done for, for a long time. But other new models, some that are um, embedded in the DARPA, ARPA approaches of building teams that include uh, uh, in, uh, uh, investigators from specific companies or even whole companies themselves, working in collaboration with academic and government scientists. Um, uh, and so the, the DARPA, ARPA program managers go out and recruit uh, specific um, individuals or co companies or programs to be able to work together on a problem that they stand up. Uh, so that's one approach. If you look at the um, new um, biotechnology and biomanufacturing executive order that just rolled out a few weeks ago, you'll see in there kind of efforts to build n novel ways to build public-private pri partnerships that recruit companies or, start, or help to start up companies that can actually move on a specific problem uh, in collaboration, again, with, with academic and government scientists. So I think there are models for being able to do that that won't run afoul of the kinds of conflicts that are pretty easy to imagine otherwise. So I'd like to follow up with you, um, Elena. How did that strike you, uh, you know, as somebody who, I, I'm not asking you to speak for the entire world of, of companies and how they might respond, but do some of these approaches seem productive to you or what would you add to them? Yeah, well, I think when we think about investing, we want to see a company that can have impact at scale. So if it's a therapeutics company, we're looking for a novel technology platform that can discover drugs that couldn't be discovered any other way. And so you could see opportunities to fund, say, a company with a therapeutic discovery platform, you know, for example, that's applied to cancer and autoimmune diseases, saying, hey, we'd like to fund you to work on, you know, tropical diseases, which, you know, as investors, we know the economic incentive just isn't there unless you can get the cost of goods way down. It's tricky. So there's opportunities to take platform companies that have a commercial incentive and also have them apply their technology to areas that wouldn't necessarily be attractive for development. And I'd like to give you the opportunity. You said you, you had a couple of other examples that oh. you didn't get to mention. Is there oh, anything okay. you yeah. want well, to I share? Mean, sure, sure. I'll take all the time. No. <laughs> um, a little. Yeah. Well, I think you know when we were talking about responsible innovation, the other company I didn't mention is Devoted Health. And it really fits more onto the clinical side here, which we were talking about earlier, which is how do you meet people where they are? How do you meet patients where they are? And it's a Medicare Advantage plan that's technology enabled. So really similar to Livongo, just earlier in its journey of using technology to identify people and drive interventions at the right time in a way that's really people-centric. So I think, you know, on the last panel, mentioned like how do you design science and technology for people that fits into the physician workflow and fits into their lives and their workflow. It turns out it relies a lot on nurses and technology that can extend nurses. But if you want to help low income people, underrepresented minorities, people who live in rural places, you need to close that last care gap of actually getting it to them, which is where nurses and technology and new models of care can really fit in. And just one other quick follow-up. I'm, I'm sorry to pick on you, but um, you mentioned you need folks in the room yeah. right when you're running out of time. Is yes. there anything that they should be thinking about specifically? Yeah, well, I mean, I think for this room, there's probably some of you who practice, some of you who don't. On the research side, what we need is those big ideas. We need ways to bring really transformative technology forward. So if you work on diagnostics, we need technology that has clinical utility and decision impact that actually changes how physicians and doctors behave. And then it needs to have medical economic impact after that. If you work on research tools, 
it needs to enable researchers to unlock a big question in biology that they couldn't answer any other way, like 10x genomics for single cell. Think about a huge swath of biology and a tool that can answer a big question. So those are the things we need is technology focused on enabling research, technology focused on helping people, and technology helping us make better medicines. Thank you very much. So I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity, since we are the third panel, to reflect a little bit, uh, both on this conversation and earlier today. And by the way, I promise I will come to the folks at the mics in just a few minutes. Um, you know, what, as you, as you think about the challenges, we've talked about so many of them, and the opportunities, we've also talked about them. You know, what, uh, what really resonated with you today, and, and what's really still worrying you? I'd love to hear from each of you on that. And you could flip it if you want to do the negative one first. I can go first because it's yeah, short. Everyone in this room should get a Gen Z mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Ask them to be your mentor. I think that, that um, broadening the scope of the uh, scientific community um, and, and by that, I really I'm, I'm focusing on the kind of comments that we heard in the last panel about the imperative of community outreach and community involvement in, the, in what we do as scientists. Um, and not at, the, not at the end, you know, when basically you're in a, a, a post-market survey of how well something <laughs> is working, but at the beginning. Um, and letting the public... Not, not letting the public in on what we're doing, but helping them to feel like they're, they are part owners of the enterprise and that their involvement, their data and their interest and their feedback on the way that we're working is really important. Um, uh, and and not, again, not just at the uh, uh, clinical trial stage where we're trying to coax data out of them, uh, but instead in really uh, letting them know what it is that we are thinking about doing and getting their feedback about the wisdom of the, que the questions that we're trying to ask and the ways that we're trying to ask them. Uh, and if we don't, and I think if we don't do that, we'll continue to be at risk for doing things that cross the line in terms of ethics and equity that we're talking about or that just put lots of resources into um, approaches that are, at the end of the day, not going to be productive. So let's, let's have a bigger scientific environment that includes people that don't, right that right now, don't think of themselves as scientists at all. Love the idea of a bigger, more inclusive environment. It does seem like inclusion is the word of the day. I think yeah. including more of um, every demographic in American science is key for us to keep innovating. Um, I was struck by the data about how lopsided all of our genetic databases are. All, all our patient databases are so lopsided that increasingly is going to be a huge problem. So anything that could be done to solve that, that, that feels like an incredibly urgent and pressing problem to solve that. Yeah, I wanted to, um, it's a worry and an opportunity, I guess. I wanted to pick up on a comment that Keith made about, you know, the endless frontier and Vannevar Bush and the investment and the model that we invest academics with discovery and then industry will pick up and make products um, and how we know now that at least um, a startup, startup ecosystem is an important part of that sort of bridge of taking inventions from academics to turn them into products so that they can grow up enough, they can become investable um, and, and keep going. Um, and the data that I showed from MIT, the thing, the thing, the worry, which I didn't show on that slide, is that um, women and minorities have been left out of that um, in huge numbers. Um, so we calculated that there would have been, there are 40 missing companies at MIT. Uh, the same study has been done at Stanford. And I suspect if you, if you did the math anywhere in the country and in the world, that women and minorities are being left out of that. So that's a worry. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity. We and others have been doing some experiments to try and hack that <laughs> um, and engage those folks. Um, and I think um, they're really hiding in plain sight. There's a whole lot of innovation and new medicines that we can accelerate uh, to the clinic. 
one other thing that I wanted to ask before we go to the audience questions. And we've talked a lot today, uh, not yet at this, this panel so much, about communication, mm -hmm. about the challenges of polarization, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, if, as you've been thinking about uh, these problems, what, what are some of the ways folks can engage productively to make sure that communication surrounding efforts such as convergence, inclusivity, uh, crossing the boundaries of, of uh, different disciplines and different uh, agencies. How, how can we do that in, per, in a productive way? We heard a lot about the problems. What are some other ways? And we heard some great, uh, great ideas for solutions. I'm going to turn it back to Gen Z. And so, so Gen Z and the millennials in my lab are incredibly engaged with education and trying, trying to bring science to kindergartners, middle school students, high school students. Um, and so they're this um, army of fired up um, scientists that, uh, that are well-trained and capable of, and, and again, incredibly passionate. Um, and so we should help them do this. Um, they're also huge users of Twitter and other social media, which I think is also coming, that we have to be better at using social media to communicate um, the good message, the right message, get information out to people. I agree with that. I also think that social media can be great for amplifying role models. You know, it used to be hard to see people that were doing science, but I think we can take an opportunity there. Um, I know actually there's a lot of science on TikTok, <laughs> which you might find hard to believe, but it's true. It's true. Communicating <laughs> with empathy is really important and assuming positive intent. So from the research community, assuming that you know the investors want to cross the valley of death we just need your help to do it um you know assuming positive intent i think social media goes a long way bob wachter is my favorite person on twitter i don't know if anyone else follows him san francisco doctor yep. nobody nobody okay thank you <laughs> he is an amazing communicator um yeah covid pioneer i think he really has a huge impact at least in the west coast yeah no i think that's true um and and so there, I think what we've heard and what all of you understand well is that there's huge urgency to working on this problem of communicating clearly what it is that we do. Um, even at the, you know, not even, at the fundamental level of people beginning to have a greater respect for the importance of evidence informing their con conclusions about problems. Um, uh, so. So I say that as a lead-in to something that you would probably object to otherwise, and that is that, that I think we also need to go all the way back to um, uh, K-12 or pre-K-16 uh, 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 education and rethink the way that we do our training that capitalizes on what I was talking about earlier, that capitalizes on the fact that human beings are innate scientists, right? Kids drive their parents crazy by always asking how and why. Um, uh, and, 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 our, and instead our education system says, memorize all the bones in the body, that's science. Well, I don't think so. And I think that, 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 that takes the kind of fun and edge and excitement out of that kind of thinking. So it's not just whether these people will end up being scientists, but instead that they begin to assimilate this notion that, that evidence, problem solving through experimentation and gathering of evidence and, and drawing conclusions that then proceed to the next step is an important way of thinking about problems in their lives overall. Um, and so I think going back and, do, and rethink, rethinking the way we do our training is important. That's not to say that there aren't things that we need to be doing today at the same time. I think we heard thinking shorter term and longer term a few times today and it, you know, it bears, <laughs> it bears, uh, bears effort. So I'd love to turn to a few of the questions from the audience. Um, please make them brief if you can. Please let us know who you are with the gentleman on my right, your left. So I'm, Bob from, uh, I'm Bob Kaplan from Stanford University. And my question is, um, is part of the problem that we've been talking about all day that our academic publication system is broken? And let me give you just a brief uh, justification for my question. Um, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, most academic uh, publication was done by university presses and professional societies. But then um, private industry came along and said, well, we'll take this over, off your hands for you. You know, there's a lot of expense in printing and binding and warehousing and so forth. 
But most of those expenses are now gone. And if you look at a company like Elsevier, they reported a profit margin of about 35% two years ago. And to put that in perspective, that's a, way more than Google and, and Amazon and about five times the profit margin of, uh, of fossil fuel companies. So I'm just curious, uh, when I hear from young people uh, and, and editors, they say, the system's really broken. Editors are telling me that they're going 15 to 20 deep to find two reviews. And the biggest complaint I get from younger fellows and graduate students is they just can't afford these open access fees. So is there, is there a better way? Uh, is, and did, did uh, giving this over to private industry, was that the right idea? It was not a good idea, and I agree with you. It's a huge problem, and I'll, I guess I'll speak on half of my colleagues at HHMI that maybe the future is going to be something where everybody preprints, so all, all discoveries are shared immediately on something like BioArchive, and then there's a post-publication peer review mechanism by which experts peer review those things that require further scrutiny, where we then find a place for the journals somewhere in this ecosystem to help curate and review, but that as scientists, we, we pull the power back to us so that we own it, we own the copyright, we decide when to share it, and I think that that's the only, the, this is the only way that we're gonna be able to improve all of the problems that, you, that you've called out, the false incentives, the billions of dollars that we spend um, giving to these publishers, the paywalls, the false prestige, um, the brand journal names that are confused with quality. So it's so many layers of problems that would be solved by immediate open sharing and layered upon it peer review. I completely agree. I think that, that um, uh, huge damage has been done by the, these big corporate publishers. Um, uh, that is affecting our training and the progressions of people's careers. Um, and, and, um, but I'm, I'm encouraged that there are models out there, experiments being done by HHMI, by eLife, by PLOS, um, uh, by science, uh, that, are, that I think can uh, begin to stand up um, approaches for the scientific community, begin to stand up approaches for being able to communicate their work that, is, that, that can be independent of uh, what the big publishers are doing. So, you know, I, I don't think that we should set as a goal to put Elsevier and Springer Nature out of, out of business. But if instead we can actually create models that the scientific community understands, begins to serve them, right, and that they actually own this process, that publication of our work is a part of the experiment, right? If we don't publish our work, it's exactly the same as not doing the experiment. Right? So why shouldn't we be able to take back that, that element of our experiments? Uh, and, and I think that there are some, some experiments that are being done now that can move in that direction. Thanks for the question, clearly struck a chord. Hi, <clears throat> Steve Goodman. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not diversifying institutions from Stanford. Um, so I'm an epidemiologist and I ask compared to what? And, and we can make the academic medicine uh, better, much better, but we have to look at what the, the, the new generation is looking for as alternatives, and I'm glad that Sangeeta mentioned startups. I mean, a lot of them are looking at that for an, an alternative career because they can fail, and they can do big, exciting things, and they be, can, can be translated to make big impact, and if they fail with that idea, they move on to another startup. And that same risk-taking is not incentivized in academia, where it gets so bad that they have to have done the experiment already to, get fun to, to have a grant that gets funded, and they're not allowed to fail. So the conservatism is basically enforced, and we're not looking at the multitude of really exciting alternative careers right now where they think that they can get rewarded, both scientifically and economically, uh, in a different way. And of course, the venture capitalists look at portfolios of risk, and they don't care if nine fail, one succeeds, that's a successful portfolio, but that doesn't work for an individual scientist where every grant must succeed to get funded, so that's why they do it first. So how do we capture this risk model to make academic ex uh, medicine, both more ex uh, science, more exciting, risk-taking and, and rewarding and stable at the same time? I think you need to have longer, um, you, you can't have a three to five year grant cycle that's based on a specific project. So exactly. I think 
so HHMI, we, we, we fund people and not projects, and it's like a long runway so that you have a long time to play before you have to explain what you've been doing. And so, and other, NIH is also experimenting with this, the Pioneer Award, the New Innovator Award, that gives you like a longer runway and more generous funding. So I think if we can get away from these little incremental project-based grants so people can play and experiment and innovate, <coughs> Um, that seems to be the, that, that is a proven formula. And, and CZI has also placed these long-term bets on, on risk. So very, very much like, it's, it's like venture investing in basic science by giving people no questions asked support for long periods of time. Those experiments are really important, but, but you know, it's, a, it's it, as, as, you know, HHMI really started this, um, and CZI and others have continued it with investigators working within the big academic structures. Um, uh, but it's still a, a problematic because failure in academia is a major problem. <laughs> um, uh, whereas, you know, failure in Silicon Valley is another day at the office. Right? You, you I, I want to say else. that, for the record, we try to help every single company <laughs> succeed. <laughs> and we believe in every single one of them. We just also give them the freedom to try hard things. But we should let the other. Back to this side of the room. Thank you very much. Uh, Meredith Niles, I'm an associate professor at the University of Vermont. I'm also one of the emerging leaders here today. Um, and I was really, well, first of all, I'm a millennial, so there's a few of us in the room you could talk to. I don't know about Gen Z. Um, but <laughs> as a millennial, I'm, I'm actually also running my own lab, right? So we're not just working in labs. Many of us are all now starting our own labs and, and having those succeed. And I was really struck by Leslie's point that, um, you know, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, the mentorship that it takes to retain diverse people in science didn't really happen. And those questions and things that people want to hear today and conversations they want to have didn't happen. Um, and that's because it takes a lot of time and effort, that kind of mentorship. And we also know that, that women and people of color are also much more likely to take on some of, some of those roles. So I, I guess my question is, especially as it relates to Keyscom about careerism, there's a mismatch between what we know it takes to be a good mentor, to retain people to, to provide that kind of mentorship, and what's actually sort of valued um, in the system, and what's the solution there? I mean, I guess we have to say that it matters how you do the science, that if you have a lab that's happy and people are supported, science will be better. So I think we just have to believe that, and we have to encourage people, the funders have to encourage people that there's simple instruments like a lab climate survey. If your lab is unhappy, fix it. Maybe the funder should be concerned that the lab is unhappy, have them fix it, and so that we value mentoring because the outcome will be a happy lab, happy labs are more productive, less, comp you know, less internal competition, less fighting, less stress, fewer people dropping out, that, that has to have a benefit. Um, and, and it shouldn't fall only on Everybody should care about this. This should not be an issue for women. <laughs> everybody, ha everybody should be caring about this because it does improve the quality of the science. Thank you for being you. <laughs> I'm sure you're a great mentor. I think we might have time for one more over to this side. Great, thank you. Hi, Sherry Barkin, Virginia Commonwealth University Children's Hospital of Richmond, formerly of Vanderbilt. Shout out to Jeff Balzer. Um, I, I wanted to just build on these questions because we have tension. How is it that we continue in robust scientific discovery that also responds to agile, ever-changing worlds? How can we make sure that we're building the long game while responding to the short game with shorter and shorter cycles and differing, differing expectations? And the question is, what would it actually look like for us to redesign academic medicine so that it could be multi-sectoral, it could be co-creation, it could be capacity building, and we could finance it and sustain it? What would that take? That's a big question for a minute and a half. <laughs> Anybody want to go first? I believe in you. <laughs> Solve everything, please. <laughs> uh, no, it's a great question. I, and I think that it, you know, building a multi-sector enterprise is going to be, take a multi-sector effort, that, we're gonna, that, that all of the, the players are going to have to be uh, thinking and working together to try to solve these problems. Identifying where the soft spots, the weak spots are, the problematic spots, uh, and then and then bearing down bearing down on them specifically. So none of the things that we've we've talked about individually up here or in the previous panels will work in isolation. Right. 
but in fact, in, in, together, I think that they can actually begin to make progress. And one of the r real values of this gathering is that not only this people who have been on, on this end of the stage, but everyone else out there who's thinking about these problems from different angles of approach and from different environments can begin to see that in fact, that they can take on this major problem as individuals or individual institutions because there's, and knowing that they can't solve it by themselves, but thank God there's other people in, the, in this room and in your communities that, that if we're working together can really begin to make progress. So it's, it's, a, it's basically a social problem. Social problems take um, enterprise, um, a very, bro very broad enterprise to be able to take them on. But I think that's, I'm encouraged that, that with this discussion and others like it, that uh, we can actually begin to move on this. So I'd love to keep going. I think, hope we will a little bit later. We'll probably need to wrap. I mean, I, I heard a lot of uh, lessons. I'm gonna put them in three buckets, but we could argue about the buckets. I mean, we, we heard about being intentional first and foremost. I, I really love that, to working together to support things, focusing on big questions and then putting the, the support in place, co-locating people. There are lots of ways we could be intentional. We talked about incentives. We talked about incentives for, for funding collaboration. We talked about funding people, not projects. We talked about looking for ways to solve problems that couldn't be solved any other way. And we talked about, probably for me, this, this one really rang home, having the time and space uh, that, that it takes to work collaboratively. We kind of ended on that note to meet people where they are, to get better at things like social media, <laughs> to cultivate our millennial and, and Gen X uh, mentors together, and to get comfortable, long and short, at being a bit uncomfortable at times. And with that, I hope you'll really join me in thanking the panelists for a really wonderful <laughs> So um, before we run away, um, we'd like to pose one final question and thank you to the panel and to our wonderful moderator. Thank you. Um, take a picture um, go or go to slider.com and the, remember it's NAM 2022 and then um, you're going to see the question which is how convinced are you that the solutions offered will be implemented at scale? and will catalyze a transformation of science and innovation in this decade. Give it a, give it a, we'll give it a second. Maybe we'll get lucky and it'll come up on the screen this time. All right, well, people are a little skeptical. I, th I think I think that's probably a <clears throat> I, I think somewhere in the middle. Um, wish wish we had more fours and fives and ones and twos, but that's probably a pretty good sense of the audience. So thank you for participating in this little experiment um, with uh, Slido. So thank you uh, once and for all to all of the moderators and panelists for such a a rich discussion today on how we can transform the scientific enterprise. I'm certain uh, that many of your comments today will stay with us and will motivate our actions for many years to come. So final round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.